The light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Therefore sanctify yourselves, that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him. For he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. This is Unveiling Jesus Christ. Hi. Welcome to another podcast on Unveiling Jesus Christ. I'm John Cassinet. I will be your host today, as always. <laughs> uh, today we're going to be talking about a new church among the seven ancient churches in Asia Minor in the time of John. Uh, we'll be starting with Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, and we'll be talking about the lukewarm Laodiceans. So this is the last of our seven cities. If you want a more complete description of this city and others, go back to my podcast on Come Follow Me, number seven, from uh, November 12th of 2023, and you'll get more details. But I'm going to give you some of the Laodicean basics, and so we're going to put up our uh, world-famous map, and as you can see, this is the last of our seven cities. It's located in the valley of the uh, Meander on a small river called the Lycus. And so uh, Laodicea ad Lycum uh, was the ancient name based on its proximity to the uh, river Lycus. It's uh, also uh, fairly close to uh, Colossae and Hierapolis um, that we're going to be talking about here in a few minutes. Uh, Laodicea got its name from Laodice, the wife of Antiochus II. He was the king of Syria that rebuilt the city in the second century BC. It's known for its black wool industry, among others. In the first century AD, at the time of John's writing, the city was extremely wealthy. And there was a devastating earthquake in 60 AD and the wealthy citizens were able to rebuild the city without the financial assistance from Rome. And this wealth was something that caused a lot of pride and the ultimate downfall of the church in uh, Laodicea. So it was a very nice city. It had uh, a large stadium. It also had three theaters that it could boast of. You know, I know today we kind of brag that we have a 16-plex. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Laodiceans had a triplex, uh, probably down at the mall somewhere in Laodicea. But at any rate, uh, three theaters was a, a pretty big deal back in those days. So eventually, um, Laodicea was destroyed by Turkish invaders, and it never rose again. And the uh, Mohammedan invaders destroyed it to the stent, to the point that uh, it was a scene of utter destruction, pretty much as prophesied by uh, John in his letter to the uh, Laodiceans. And so uh, there are extensive ruins and there were multiple campaigns against the city. For example, in 1071 AD, the, the city was taken by the Seljuks. In 1119, it was uh, recovered by the Christians, but then in the 13th century, it finally fell into the hands of the Turks, never to rise again. And today it's pretty much deserted. It goes by the name of Eski Hisar, which means old castle in modern Turkey. It had a deadly end uh, to both the city and the church as prophesied when the Savior began this letter through John saying, these things saith the Amen. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but that was the pronouncement uh, made by the Savior on this city because of their lukewarm status. And unlike other uh, sites where you find these seven cities, uh, that have been rebuilt kind of on the old ruins. There's no modern city that actually sits on top of the ruins of Laodicea. So it was truly never rebuilt. And uh, that's consistent with the message that uh, is delivered to them in this letter of John. So let's jump right in looking at uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, which says, quote, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, close quote. So here we have our seventh letter from Patmos to the angel, which is, of course, the servant, the bishop, the ecclesiastical leader at uh, Laodicea. Uh, it's generally thought that uh, the bishop at the time of John's letter was a guy by the name of uh, Archippus, 
Uh, he's identified by Paul in the book of Colossians and also in the Apostolic Constitutions, which I've talked about before. These are the eight books uh, written in the early fourth century that had or contained these sort of pseudo-apostolic prescriptions. And uh, they also say that uh, Archippus was the bishop of Laodicea at the time. And they also indicate that uh, Archippus was the son of Philemon, one of the New Testament writers. And so uh, I'm not sure if that uh, gives us enough data to add Archippus as the son of Philemon into family search for purposes of doing <laughs> our family history work and temple work. Uh, you know, so I'll leave that to you. <laughs> so the, the word Laodicea means justice of the people, which is kind of a fitting name for church members who were pretty much guided by their own standard of devotion. And so uh, it's a church that had uh, truth that w had been diluted with a lot of error. And this came from the fact that they were very wealthy in this city and the members of the church tended to share in the city's wealth to the point that uh, they shared and enjoyed the same kind of social status. So there's really no persecution of this church from these outside uh, sources such as the Jewish community. Uh, they weren't uh, terribly opposed to them because they pretty much got along and uh, acted in harmony more or less. So this is one of the two churches that uh, Christ had nothing good to say about them and it was due to their formality of their worship, their hypocrisy, their lukewarmness, and their general indifference to religion. And in this sense they were pretty much similar to the city of Sardis that was also condemned without commendation. So the Laodicean church probably began through Paul's ministry at the time he was in Ephesus, but uh, it was only indirect. We don't have any indication that Paul personally visited the Laodicean saints or that city, and he wrote to them from Rome to Colossae. And uh, so if you read the book of Colossians, you see this greeting that was also extended to the saints in Laodicea, and that was probably the nature of uh, his ministry. And so keep in mind that Eph Ephesus uh, was kind of this hub of a, a spiritual place where people did pilgrimages to that city. And so Paul taught there for about three years, and through the influence of his teachings in Laodicea, these pilgrims would come into Ephesus and then they would kind of take the, the new message of the gospel out to these other places like Laodicea. And so it was a place where the church uh, initially flourished, meaning uh, Laodicea. Uh, it had a large Jewish population, which is probably one of the reasons why uh, the uh, church took a pretty strong hold in the city. And it's prominently mentioned in Paul's epistle to the uh, Colossians. It may have been a regional center of uh, church administration. We do know that uh, centuries later, in 363 AD, there was a Catholic council that was convened here in Laodicea to decide what books would be included in the Bible canon. We have a little bit of a description of that council by a uh, archdeacon in the Catholic Church from the 1700s. He was uh, Archdeacon Pally or Paley that said uh, that this council declared rather than regulated the public judgment on what would be included in the Bible. And he mentioned that the council itself consisted of no more than 30 or 40 bishops of Lydia and the adjoining countries. And he also states that after this council, the question of the Bible canon then was more or less discussed with pretty great freedom among the people, but uh, he doesn't specifically indicate that there was a specific declaration from Laodicea as to what the Bible canon should be. So if you want to know more about the canonization of the Bible, including uh, efforts to include the book of Revelation in the canon as it ultimately now exists, that you can check out my podcast from Come Follow Me number two, which I did on October 8th of uh, 2023. So. Paul's epistle, when he wrote to the Colossians, as I mentioned, uh, talks about Laodicea. And this particular uh, epistle or letter was apparently intended for multiple cities, including 
Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. And so I'm going to put back up our world famous map so you can get a sense again where uh, Laodicea lies. And then there's this triangles of city not shown on the map, but essentially Colossae would have been 18 miles to the west and uh, the city of Hierapolis would have been six miles further south than Laodicea. And so you kind of have this triangle of cities that were probably the subject of uh, Paul's letter when he wrote to the saints in Colossae. All three churches were probably founded by a guy by the name of Epaphras. Um, he's mentioned three times in the New Testament, and he was with Paul when Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians. And so you read in Colossians 4.16 saying, quote, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, close quote. So there he's, uh, Paul is essentially giving directions to uh, Epaphras uh, about what he's supposed to do in his missionary work with these uh, cities. Now it's noteworthy that uh, although there are indications that Paul did also write a letter to the Laodicean saints, um, it, that letter has not been found, or at least it was never made part of the Bible canon. And some actually say that uh, his letter to Laodicea was essentially a copy of the letter that he had written to the Ephesians. So let's talk about some of the phrases that you'll find in uh, these verses, starting with uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. It says, These things saith the Amen. So this is the one and only time where the word amen is used as a personal name. Uh, the Hebrew word or the Hebrew equivalent for the word amen is verily or truth. And so uh, it tends to be a pronouncement of a truth that is fixed, unchangeable. It has a divine certainty associated with it. And the words spoken here by the amen essentially shall never pass away and shall never go unfulfilled. Now, you'll notice that a lot of times in the New Testament, Christ often will preface some of his solemn utterances by the words, verily, verily. So, for example, verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, I think in John 3, 5 was one of those instances where he said, except a man be born of the water and of the spirits, so on and so forth. And so the fact that he uses verily, verily is like saying, amen, amen, I say unto you as something that is certain and, uh, and required. And it is a, an essential truth, uh, more or less. And so uh, it's kind of interesting because if you think about this a little bit, uh, and my wife served her mission down in Alabama, down in the Bible Belt, so she could probably tell you more about this than I can. But I do know <clears throat> from some of the Protestant gatherings, you know, some of these uh, people uh, get together and uh, they'll start uh, when the preacher's uh, going off and, uh, you know, the people, the audience, are, an amen, brother. <laughs> You say, give me an amen for that. Amen. And so essentially, it's a declaration of agreement with what is being said and an expression that this is true. And so that's what essentially that means. It reminds me of a little bit of my mission experience when I was in Holland. Uh, we had this uh, older sister that uh, would attend the sacrament meetings and uh, she would talk back to the speaker as well. I may have said this story before, but uh, she would always say, if you said something that was uh, particularly uh, noteworthy, she would say, that is verklik var. <laughs> Which is to say, that is really true. And then sometimes you'd say, yeah, naturally, which is, means yes, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, uh, I remember speaking there and uh, just uh, enjoying very much uh, having her in the audience whenever I spoke or frankly anyone else. So at any rate, the, uh, uh, the application of the name Amen to Christ shows he is the fulfillment 
of all that God has spoken to this church and to all the other churches. And so it is essentially by saying, I'm the amen, and this is what I'm telling you. It is a guarantee of the truth of every statement and the fulfillment of every promise he makes. Now, what's interesting is that amen usually signals the end of a prayer or a pronouncement, unless you're in the Bible Belt, and then it's kind of strewn throughout. Um, but more often than not, you know, you say amen at the end of, of an ordinance, at the end of a prayer. But in this case, the, the letter actually starts with the word amen to declare as a truth the amen or the end of the Laodiceans. And so uh, the destruction of the city that I've already talked about kind of bears witness of this unalterable truth that is spoken here at the beginning of the letter by Christ as the Amen. Now, you'll find a similar kind of uh, declaration in Doctrine and Covenants section 121, verse 37, which states in part, quote, When we undertake to cover our sins or to gratify our pride, our vain ambition, or to exercise control or dominion or compulsion, upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves, the Spirit of the Lord is grieved, and when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood or the authority of that man." Close quote. So here in this verse you find this declaration or the use of the word amen to pronounce that uh, those who seek unrighteous dominion will have removed from them their priesthood authority. That is, it's the end of it. It is the amen of your authority. So moving on to another phrase that we find in Revelation 3.14, it references the faithful and true witness. And this is an extension of the name title amen to Jesus Christ, which of course we have identified as something that is true, it is certain, and it is faithful. And so this declaration is essentially mirroring what we already know about Christ and his attributes, that he is one who is imminently true and faithful in all of his works, in all of his provinces, and in all the covenants he has made with you and I. Then in the next phrase, it says that Christ is also the beginning of the creation of God, which is kind of interesting. They said, well, what's that doing here in the middle of this verse? And uh, if you go to Colossians 1.15, you find a similar kind of statement that states that Christ is the firstborn of every creature. So we find ourselves speaking about Christ as the amen, as kind of the end, and now we jump back really all the way back to the time of the premortal existence when Christ was the firstborn of all the spirit children of the Father, who is Elohim. Not only that, he's the first creation, spiritually speaking, of all God's spirit creations. And so essentially he is the first cause or creation of all, all God's spirit creations, which we learn about in Moses 1, 32 through 33. It makes him first in time, first in rank among all God's creation. He is in essence the king of creation and he has the originating power and the priority of existence. And so stated together with the word amen, and true and faithful emphasizes his power to essentially do what he predicts. And so with him as the uh, beginning of creation, it also, it, the title expresses this inferiority of all other things, including, as it relates to the Laodiceans, their wealth, their material objects, and the things that they have worshipped. And that even members of the church have tended to participate in just so that we can all kind of get along and not bring about themselves any kind of persecution. And so in the uh, city of Laodicea, you had Zeus as the city's patron deity, but there were also a number of other temples for Apollo, the sun god, Asclepius, the uh, healing god, Hades, the, the god of the underworld and the dead, and uh, Hera, Athena, Serapis, and Dionysius. So, you know, they had a full platter of gods that they could worship. And so the uh, fact that the Savior is declaring himself 
to be this uh, beginning of the creation of God, just sets aside all of these other inferior gods and prepares the Laodiceans to hear from the Savior the awful truths that he was about to declare and the authority on which his declarations are also founded. And so it's kind of interesting also that Christ frequently identifies himself as the beginning and the end. But in this verse, we have the reversal of this natural order by mentioning the amen at the end, which normally comes at the end. And this is coming at the beginning, before the beginning actually begins. And so essentially the amen is identifying himself as the beginning. Typically, it's the beginning and the end. Here we have essentially the end and the beginning. It also alludes to the words in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, where the same type of end to the beginning is found, in which we find in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, which says, quote, Remember this, and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Close quote. So you can see in these words of Isaiah, he's basically saying everything that I've been saying for who knows how long. I guess we could have just read that and called it good. But there's a clear expression here of the this beginning to the end uh, and the power associated with Christ's ability to bring all of these things about. And the context of Isaiah's writing is the same kind of context, a, a curse upon the wicked from the end of the beginning by one who has the power to bring it about. And so Christ, who has all knowledge, he's omniscient, uh, he can see the end of the Laodiceans from the time or the beginning of his proclamations that he's making in this letter. And so uh, it, we find something similar stated in Acts 15, 18, where it says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, close quote. And so we have these kinds of expressions in uh, other places. Um, it's also important to talk about the end before the beginning because it's always true that the end of the old tends to pave the way for the beginning of the new. So every end has its new beginning. So it's not like we're telling the Laodiceans, this is it for you, because it, it is, but not forever. And so the Lord has, uh, you know, these uh, very uh, large plans and uh, the, the entire plan of salvation is based on uh, endings and beginnings. You end the premortal existence to begin your mortal existence. You end your mortal existence to begin your immortal uh, and eternal existence. And so these things, it's not like we're going to just have an end to everything and nothing ever has a beginning. And this is kind of expressed in Isaiah 65, verses 16 through 18, which says in part, quote, because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy." Close quote. So even though we have the uh, end of Christ's ancient church uh, uh, among the Laodiceans during the great apostasy because of their lukewarm condition that I'm about to talk about, uh, that must inevitably lead to the new beginning of a restored church in the latter days. And the restoration must inevitably follow the loss of the ancient church, not only in the city of Laodicea, but the, the church in the meridian of time generally. We also have this end that will come to great wickedness at the time of the second coming, which must then invariably and inevitably lead to the beginning of righteousness during the millennium. So all these endings have a new beginning, and, and that's the good news. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the bad news for the Laodiceans that we find in Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, where the Savior says, quote, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm, 
and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, close quote. So once again, we have the declaration, I know thy works, that's found in all seven letters to all seven churches. And here the statement is that Christ knows the mediocrity of the Laodiceans. In other words, they are a people and members of the church who are indecisive. They are indifferent. They are slothful, listless, uh, spiritually lethargic, if you will, and even careless in following the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, when I use the word careless, being a lawyer, of course, uh, I have to talk about the, what is the standard of carelessness because another word for careless is that you're negligent. And it reminds me of this uh, case that I took that was a personal injury case. Now, I, I wasn't really a personal injury lawyer, um, but sometimes if, if a personal injury case was tangential, if you will, to something else I was doing, uh, I would tend to get involved in them a little bit, more out of just, I know the people, okay, I'll, I'll take care of this for you. And so one time I had this uh, couple come in and the woman had been injured. She was a home health care person and she had been going up to this home to do some care in this home. And as she was walking, the, there was this, uh, the sidewalk consisted of basically these wooden boards, these old wooden boards. And one of them was broken and, and bowed down. And so she kind of, the board bowed down and she tripped on it and twisted her ankle. She ends up eventually contracting RSV, which is a very, very serious thing that just, it's horrible. But uh, at any rate, so she came to me because her lawyer uh, was doing a horrible job on her case and she wanted to sue him for legal malpractice, which was essentially what I did. And as I got to looking at it, the case was still pending. I said, well, he hasn't really, yeah, he's done a bad job. I mean, he was trying to get her to settle for this some minimal nominal amount, you know, he just a paper mill basically, just to churn cases. Um, and so he wasn't really putting in the time and effort on it and trying to get her to take this minimal settlement. And so she came to me to sue him for malpractice. I said, well, it can still be fixed. So I'm gonna take your case. So I, I got into the case. Um, I did, uh, I took the, uh, the homeowner who was the woman um, of the house. Uh, I took her deposition and she, she was just this horrible witness. And uh, now in order to establish neg negligence or carelessness on the part of a homeowner, you kind of got to show they had knowledge of a dangerous condition. They had an appreciation and recognition of the danger. And then they didn't do anything to take any action to fix it when it was easily fixed. All right. And so as I'm taking her deposition, uh, it was clear that she knew about it. So did you know you had this problem? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you knew that it could be dangerous? Did you have a sense that it might, if somebody could fall because of this condition? And she said, well, yeah, I kept telling my husband he should fix it so no one gets hurt. <laughs> and about that time, the uh, defense lawyer who was sitting next to her kicked her under the table. <laughs> and she, she turned to him and says, stop kicking me. <laughs> <laughs> right in the deposition. Now, this wasn't a videotape deposition, but it was just classic. And I'm sure I never got a transcript of the deposition, but I'm sure she spoke loud enough that the court reporter would have been able to take down what the woman said when she said, stop kicking me. <laughs> but just to make sure that it was clear what had happened, I then, as soon as she says, stop kicking me, and I said, uh, the record should reflect that counsel has kicked his client under the table. <laughs> But at any rate, so that's just some of the crazy things that happen when you're, you're doing these cases. But uh, needless to say, the, the case settled within about one week's time for the policy limits of somewhere around $300,000. And this other attorney was trying to get her to sell for like twenty five. <laughs> So at any rate, uh, that but that's the notion of negligence. When we talk about negligence is you, you have this recognition um, and you're not doing anything about this dangerous condition in your spiritual lives. And so uh, the, uh, the idea is, is that this is what was the problem in the uh, Laodicean saints is that they, they, they just weren't doing anything. And Joseph Fielding Smith said, he that does nothing is good for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so this apathy of the uh, members in the Laodicean church is, of course, a universal type for saints in the latter days. And that's probably why I think that uh, there are more 
quotes and general conference talks and other things to the uh, to the saints in Laodicea, uh, these lukewarm members, than in any other of the seven churches in the church today, and uh, and that's because it it is a problem that exists uh, even within the church today. It's a problem of apathy in the church, which is kind of a microcosm of the much larger apathy, spiritually speaking, of the world in general. Now, the difference between the spiritual apathy in the world at large is that the world at large hasn't made covenants with Jesus Christ to keep his commandments, to live the gospel, to be fervent and to be valiant in your testimony of Jesus Christ. So there's a big difference when the world is spiritually apathetic and when people within the church are spiritually apathetic. Um, but it's, uh, it is a fact, I think, that the spiritual apathy that exists in the world is tending to influence and infect bringing about a certain indef indifference uh, to the members uh, within the church. And, and that's essentially what the, the Savior is concerned about and what he's talking about in this ladder to the Laodicean church. Okay, in uh, verse 15, it has this phrase, thou art neither cold nor hot. And when we talk about the word hot, that comes from the Greek word called zestos, which means it's kind of this boiling hot. It's also translated in other places as fervent. And it would suggest that uh, you have a similar kind of connotation associated with the word cold, that that should be, uh, you need to be more than just cool. I mean, cold, he's saying uh, you're neither icy cold or positively cold, not just cool. Um, but you're, you're neither icy cold nor fervently boiling hot. And that's the nature of the problem with them that causes them to be essentially spiritually warm. And Bruce R. McConkie had this to say about that condition, quote, we cannot survive spiritually with one foot in the church and the other in the world. We must make the choice. It is either the church or the world. There is no middle ground. Those who do not take an affirmative, <clears throat> courageous stand against the world and in favor of the church shall go to the terrestrial kingdom. Such persons are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. They belong to the church, but do not magnify their callings in the priesthood, act diligently in the offices to which they are appointed. They are hearers of the word, not doers." Close quote. So that was from a talk by Elder McConkie in uh, General Conference in uh, 1974. Now this cold and hot imagery fits Laodicea perfectly. The Savior again, as the master teacher, uses the context and environmental conditions of the hearers of his word, and that's true here in Laodicea because Laodicea was a city that had to have its water kind of piped in. And the water was coming either from uh, Colossae, which is a source of these cold water springs, or from Hierapolis, which was the source of hot water springs that existed in that area. And so Hierapolis is actually called Pambuk Kalisi, or Cotton Castle. And not because it grows ca cotton, but because of the white deposits from the water, the calcium deposits in these springs, it has this white ground all over the place. And so uh, essentially for Laodicea, you have aqueducts that have to bring the water in from these surrounding springs. And by the time the water reached Laodicea, it was either lukewarm. It didn't matter which direction it came from. The hot gets cooler as it goes through the aqueduct. The cold gets warmer. And so what you end up with in Laodicea was lukewarm. I personally, I would rather live in <laughs> either of the other two cities. But that be that the case, it's also a fact that particularly from the water coming from Hierapolis, you have the water that has a certain amount of sulfur contamination, and so it had a bad taste. And that problem is compounded when the water is tepid or when it's lukewarm. And so it has this kind of an unpleasant and was water that was sort of sickening to drink. And so here you have the, the Lord making this statement about how he was going to spew out these lukewarm Laodiceans out of his mouth. And uh, that's what uh, tepid water has this, descend, this tendency to do. It makes you feel a little nauseous or it gives you this inclination that you got to vomit. 
<laughs> Which reminds me, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I never really liked the taste of uh, homogenized milk. When when we were growing up on the ranch and we had milk cows, we would, uh, you know, milk the cows and then uh, you'd leave the, the, the milk in a uh, gallon jar overnight. And during the night, the, the cream would rise to the top and you'd skim that off. Um, and pretty much have skim milk, which was not bad. I, I, I could handle that okay, uh, as long as the cream was off and it was pretty much icy cold, you know, I could handle it. Um, the only time when I would drink warm milk is if we were out in the barn and, and Grandpa was milking and he'd squirt milk into our mouth from the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I only put up with it because, you know, Grandpa liked to do it and, you know, it was kind of unique and something, you know, think about it, you said, yeah, probably 60 years from now I'll be able to talk about this in a podcast, so <laughs> I put up with it, but no, at any rate, but this warm homogenized melt would tend to make me gag, and I remember one time my mother had a glass of milk on the table that she wanted me to drink and it sat there for a while and I wouldn't drink it and she wouldn't let me get up from the table until I drank it and so the thing's getting warmer and <laughs> warmer and I sat there for a while and finally she got mad at me she was tired of babysitting me trying to get me to drink my milk and this is probably somewhere you know third to sixth grade it had to be I remember the the house that we were living in and uh, she you drink that milk now <laughs> So, so, you know, and she knew I did not like milk, uh, but she was going to force me on this occasion and exercise her will. I think it was unrighteous dominion, in fact. But at any rate, uh, so I grab the milk and I start gulping. <laughs> and so I, I put it down and I drink it and I start gagging. And she says, don't you, don't. <laughs> And before she could finish her sentence, blah, I just throw up all this milk all over the kitchen at any rate. And uh, that was the last time she ever forced me to drink milk. <laughs> so that was the good news. But at any rate, so here we have this, this image of the, uh, the, the saints uh, who are lukewarm and the Savior. And this is a really intense metaphor. You know, that uh, you think of the, the Savior and his embracing arms and his loving attention to the members of his church. And here he's talking about spewing them out, vomiting them out of his mouth. And uh, it expresses this sort of deep disgust and uh, loathing at the indifference of the members of the church in Laodicea and it essentially reflects the idea that there is going to be this utter rejection of these people. They will be cast off as a church as would anyone who finds themselves in the same condition. We, we shouldn't think that uh, just because we live in modern times if we share the attributes of lukewarmness and indifference in the gospel that we're going to be treated any way different and so uh, uh, it's something that was true of the wicked inhabitants of Canaan they were similarly to be vomited out of the mouth of uh, Jehovah and this is reflected in Leviticus uh, chapter 18 verse 25 which says quote and the land is defiled therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants, close quote. So anciently, uh, in the meridian of time, modern, it's all the same. And uh, if you are lukewarm in your adherence uh, and your commitment to the gospel, uh, you can plan on getting uh, literally vomited out, which connotes, uh, the Greek word connotes this utter rejection. And the uh, Lord's disgust is greater here in the... Um, Laodicean church that in any other church except Sardis and Sardis you'll remember was another one of these churches where the Savior didn't have anything good to say about them and they were described as a people who were alive but dead dead spiritually and you can find out more about them if you haven't already listened to my podcast on Sardis in Revelation 3 verses 1 through 3 which I did on uh, March 23rd of 24. So essentially uh, these Laodiceans who are spiritually lukewarm are described in verse 17 that we're going to get to uh, next time as a spiritually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked people. All really, really strong words that uh, uh, kind of lead me to think, you know, I need to look at myself a little bit here. 
maybe I want to do some things differently and be a little bit more fervent and boiling hot um, than uh, what I currently am. And so again, these are these these people are sort of self-satisfied and. Uh, worldly and they're going to be ostracized by Christ completely and we find the image that he uses of a door um, that is familiar to a lot of us where you have Christ standing outside the door knocking for admission this is another statement or a metaphor that is used in connection with these saints from Laodicea so it's not like he's not trying he's not doing his part he's standing and knocking but the door, of course, has to be open from the inside, and we're all familiar with that metaphor and that imagery. Now, this imagery is also captured in a chiastic word pattern from uh, Revelation uh, chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. So we'll put up kind of this image of what the chiastic pattern looks like in these two verses, and it starts out, I know thy works, that's line 1 or A, that thou art neither cold nor hot, Line C, I would that thou wert cold or hot. And then at C, we then start to repeat. So then, because thou art lukewarm, which is another way of saying you're neither cold nor hot, and you see that that's at the center of the chiasma. So that's the focus. The, the Savior is really focused like this laser pointer on these particular phrases. You're, you're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. And because of that, in line B again, and are neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And so you have this chiastic pattern. So I mean, there's no holds bars. John used everything in this letter to try and convince these saints uh, that there is essentially no middle ground between hot and cold, between serving God and serving mammon. Having, as Bruce R. McConkie said, one foot in the church and one foot outside the church. And you have to understand that when a person is baptized and makes covenants at baptism, the neutral ground ceases to exist from them. And you can't have uh, neutrality on earth after you make these covenants anymore than there could be no neutrality during the pre-mortal war in heaven. you got to pick a side. Um, and so that's essentially what uh, is being talked about here. Now, keep in mind that John isn't saying that God is pleased with someone who is cold in their religious practices, right? He says, I would that you'd either be cold or hot. Well, he's not saying, don't read into that. Oh, okay, it's okay to be cold. <laughs> because uh, the problem and the reason why this emphasis is made is because at least a person who is cold has this recognition that they're cold, they're uncomfortable, and they do something about it. But a lukewarm Christian is someone who is comfortable and complacent, and so they don't necessarily ever even recognize that they have a problem. And this is the reason why Christ decidedly prefers cold people to those who are indifferent and lukewarm and someone who doesn't even recognize that they have a problem. And so I think that there are essentially five reasons for this sort of counterintuitive truth that the Savior would want you to be either cold or hot. And so number one is, first of all, lukewarmness is a reflection of someone who is hypocritical. And, and you've heard many times in the New Testament how he really rails on hypocrisy. And so this is that outward appearance of some type of Christ-like devotion, but lack of an inward commitment. Um, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to the people around it. And he hates liars. I mean, he really does. And so that's number one. Number two is the lukewarm saints essentially make a mockery of the plan of salvation. So they violate their sacred covenants by not being valiant in their testimony of Jesus Christ and they live beneath their privileges to enter into the celestial kingdom. So he went to all this work to build this earth, many others like it, and what do we get a bunch of people who just take it for granted and, and treat it like it's nothing and, and don't place any importance on uh, the, the gospel that is going to allow them to inherit this beautiful world forever. Uh, and so uh, it just kind of sets the plan of salvation to one side. And, you know, it's kind of be frustrating. <laughs> but at any rate, the third point is... Um, these lukewarm saints are what the Savior would refer to in the 
parable of the talents as the one talent servant. And so in Matthew 25, verses 24 through 28, it says, quote, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast it that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents." Close quote. Now, what I find interesting about this uh, particular parable is note that when we're talking about the talents, so often we have in our mind this idea that we are given these talents. They belong to us, and we can do with them what we will. If we want to be lukewarm with them, hey, it's my talent. I can do what I want. You know, the old Napoleon Dynamite syndrome, I do what I want, right? But notice in these verses, it tells us that when the servant says what he did with it, he says, I was afraid and I went and I hid thy talent in the earth. So the, the talent belongs to the Lord. And when the Savior is telling him what he should have done, he said, you should have taken and put my money to the exchangers. And then I would have received mine own usury, that is interest, on my money, right? And because he didn't do that, of course, it gets taken away from him, which is only right because it doesn't belong to him in the first place. It's on loan. And so he gives it unto the one with the ten talents. And, you know, growing up, I always used to wonder, I think, well, well how is that fair? How, does, how come the guy that has the ten, he went and he got ten more, um, and now he gets another one? Well, you have to understand, of course, that we're talking about the kingdom of God, where the whole point of the plan of salvation and the creation of worlds without number is so that uh, glory can be added to this kingdom of God. And so if you've got somebody who's got 10 talents and he's using them well, the glory is added upon in the celestial kingdom by, and we maximize our efforts in adding glory to the kingdom by giving it to the people who are going to do something with it. And so it goes back to this, uh, this notion of the law of consecration, that we consecrate all that we have to the Father just as he consecrates it back to us. Well, if the Father's kingdom have ha can have greater glory added to it by giving those who are more worthy and are going to use the talents the way they were intended, then we're going to take it from the guy that has one talent, doesn't do anything with it, give it to the guy with ten, because it will add to the kingdom. It maximizes the glory of the kingdom. And so that's why we, we find it being given to the guy with the uh, 10 talents. Now, this is also similar. The, the Laodiceans are similar to the d disobedient son in the parable of the two sons, which we find in Matthew 21, verses 28 through 31, which says, quote, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, Go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did the will of the Father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you, close quote. And the Savior, of course, was giving this uh, uh, parable to the uh, chief priests, the scribes, these elders, the ones he's always describing as hypocrites. <laughs> and essentially, they are the second son who says, yeah, I'll go and do it. So they have this outward appearance of doing good things, but they're really not doing uh, the things that they should be. So they're professing to do good, but they're allowing the vineyard to uh, degenerate, essentially. And so the second disobedience that uh, has this veneer of spirituality, but uh, no inward commitment. And that's the nature of the Laodicean saints also expressed in this uh, parable of the two sons. Now, the fourth point as to why the Savior would like to see someone who is decidedly cold versus someone uh, who is lukewarm or also hot, 
uh, is because the, the lukewarm saints are basically in this spiritual rut of indifference. They follow the path of least resistance that makes crooked rivers and crooked men, when in fact the Savior has pointedly and on numerous occasions say that people need to be on the straight and narrow path. It's not the easy path, it's not the path of least resistance, but it is the path that will assure you that you are neither hot nor cold. And that's uh, essentially what th that you're not cold, but that you are in fact hot, I mean to say. And so um, the fifth thing is that uh, these lukewarm saints have these hardened hearts that essentially the spirit can't penetrate. They are incapable of change to bring about good works. And that's the danger of being lukewarm. You have cold people who are misguided in their commitment to a wrong cause. These can have their hearts changed because they're passionate about something. They, they have a belief in something rather than just this indifference. And this was the case with uh, Paul, who was first known as Saul of Tarsus. He went about, you know, killing the saints and persecuting them and bringing them to the synagogue for a trial and having them scourged. And I mean, he was just completely misguided in his uh, belief. And he was a, what we would have to say is just a totally cold type of person. But because of his passion, he could be changed. And one experience on the road to Damascus and suddenly you have a new person. He says, oh, I recognize the error of my way. And now to the same extent that he was cold in his passion, he became the hottest, if you will, of the apostles in the, uh, the apostolic church. Uh, it had the greatest influence in the, uh, the Greek speaking world. And so uh, this is the nature of the danger of uh, lukewarmness and why I think the Lord would rather see someone who is essentially uh, cold because that person can change. That's an Alma person. That's a son of Messiah kind of person who, because they're passionate and, and not lukewarm, we can change those kind of people and they can have the same kind of fervor um, as someone who is hot. Now, it's interesting to note that it actually takes energy to make water either cold or hot. So we, we used to have this uh, pebble ice machine and we loved it. And uh, you know, you gotta plug it in and it uses energy to make this nice ice. It's just chewy, right? Um, uh, and so you gotta have that. And if you wanna heat your house, it's gonna take energy. Maybe you have a gas stove, electrical, whatever you have, maybe a coal, and you bring in the coal that has this energy and you, it, it, you, it takes this energy to create hot or cold. But spiritually apathetic people uh, are too lazy, they're too indifferent or stubborn, which we call pride, to put in the energy. They refuse to expend the spiritual energy necessary to become committedly cold or hot. And that's what the, the Savior wants. And that's what this life is all about, to come here to expend energy, to make something of ourselves. And so the commitment to be cold or hot is essentially an exercise of agency. And lukewarm saints essentially are surrendering the gift of agency through their apathetic inaction. It leaves them in a condition essentially to be acted upon. And this is what was talked about in 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 14, which says, quote, there is a God and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are both things to act and things to be acted upon, close quote. So we as humans who have this uh, blessing of moral agency are those things which are designed to act, not just to be acted upon. Now, if we if we use our exercise, uh, use or exercise our agency in the wrong way, then ultimately our agency will be taken from us. And the scriptures talk about how essentially the only thing that will be left of you is for the law to then act upon you and exercise its justice upon you because you have failed to make the correct choices in the exercise of your agency. And so um, if there is no agency, um, essentially humans would only act as we are acted upon. We would be like this robot or a machine. And so this is what's occurring when people essentially just conform their lives. They think, well, this is a, a life choice. No, it's really not. You're not choosing to do something 
active in your life and to move your life forward. You are basically like the, lo the salt that has lost its savor and is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. And so, you know, when I think about this, how essentially just being in a rut, you don't do anything to get out. You just kind of, you take it wherever you want. It's this meandering stream, right, that's following the, the course of least resistance. And uh, essentially, uh, you know, I think about these images. Sometimes you have these images of, uh, I think it's probably the Snake River or something like that, how you've got these meandering streams, and they're very, very deep, cut into these cliffs, right? Um, and, uh, you know, that has been that way for a long, long time. And what must it have been like when initially that little meandering stream, if you could have, uh, you know, plowed through and gone through, what a very different uh, river it would be. But <clears throat> at any rate, I, I digress here a little bit. But uh, essentially you have these people who surrender their agency until they are firmly entrenched and rooted like the Snake River in these uh, canyons where you can't change. Um, and so you're only going to be acted upon. And, and I've got to believe that this surrender of agency must truly offend God deeply. And maybe that's why he's going to vomit out these Laodicean saints who have basically given up or surrendered their agency. Think about the heavy price that was paid to preserve the agency of mankind. It's been purchased with the price of Christ's suffering and his atoning sacrifice satisfied the demands for justice for sin and this was the very thing that Lucifer sought to take away in the premortal existence, right? He, he said, I, I have a different plan. Um, essentially, I'm going to force everyone to heaven and uh, since no one is going to be lost because I'm going to force them there, uh, give me the credit, I want the glory, blah, 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 okay? And this is what uh, was said in Moses chapter 4, verse 3 about that. It said, quote, Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down, close quote. And so essentially... Uh, this is the situation where the Lord, um, he lost a third of his spirit children to Satan's idea and his etiology. They went with him. What a tremendous loss, all to preserve the power and right and gift of agency. And so when people get down here, having exercised their agency in the premortal existence, yeah, I'm willing to take that risk. And they come down here and then they, they do nothing with it. They don't do anything to exert the spiritual energy that is required to have them flourish and to be strong and to, to be boiling hot or at least cold. At least you're doing something, right, with your life, even though you might be misguided. And eventually those people who are cold, probably they get to the other side and they realize, oh, mea culpa. <laughs> and then they will have the energy, the wherewithal, and the drive to, to repent might not be in this life, but at least they have the drive to do it, whereas a lukewarm, slothful person doesn't even have the drive to do that and may not even recognize it. So it's, by way of conclusion, we have some important lessons for us all in the account of the uh, Laodiceans, and it's kind of easy to say, well, that's definitely not me. Uh, be careful, because that's be the very nature of being lukewarm, is that you kind of say, I'm doing all right, I, I don't have any problems. <laughs> And so think about what you can do maybe this week, maybe uh, something, uh, a commitment to, to improve on something and to put a little bit of energy into something. Um, you know, my wife, uh, when she does things um, with Relief Society and stuff like that, I mean, she's very passionate about it. She goes out, we're, we're having a chili cook-off here uh, in the not too far future and uh, for the decorations. I mean, she's going all out and says, it's just a chili cook-off. You know, I'm a, luke, I'm a lukewarm kind of guy when it comes to decorations for chili cook-offs, but she's passionate, she's, she's valued, she's boiling hot, uh, and she, she expends all of this energy on it and to her credit. And so should it be for all of us in everything we do in the gospel, there should be this passion about it. And if we do, then we will never find ourselves in this uh, rut 
of uh, being spiritually lukewarm. So thanks for watching, um, listening, subscribing, say, sharing. Uh, thanks to Jenna for all the techno stuff. Next week we'll continue our discussion about the uh, Laodicean saints and uh, I hope to see you then.